Please note that this chapter has some graphic information. There are pictures of individuals whose bodies uh, did not develop in accordance to what we consider to be the standard or the norm. Uh, that those slides will come up later and we'll be discussing why their bodies developed that way. Additionally, this course is a little heavy on terminology, so I'd strongly recommend that you repeat this video uh, at least a couple of times so you could get a thorough understanding of the concepts discussed and the terminology. As we seek to understand who we are, we have to look at our genetic foundations, and that is to look at where we come from. If you've taken biology, or if you have some knowledge of this in here, you may remember that we are a byproduct of 46 chromosomes. That is, 23 coming from mom and 23 coming from dad. Now, it's not always the case. There are some individuals who have chromosomal difficulties, and that is, they have one too many or more, or they have uh, fewer than the 46. Individuals who have 46 are considered to be the standard, but it's not always a given. Now, as individuals have intercourse, um, typically about 36 hours after intercourse, depending on the woman's menstrual cycle, uh, there will be a conception. And conception is depicted here in this picture uh, at the bottom, where you have the sperm uh, going into the egg. And that's when conception takes place. Now, when this occurs uh, instantly, we end up with these 23 pairs of chromosomes that are seen here. And these right here, especially this one at the bottom, the very last one, uh, is the 23rd pair. This 23rd pair indicates that there is uh, going to be an X and a Y. The way we know that this is an X and a Y, therefore a male, is because of the size difference. Had it been a female, then uh, they would be similar in length, uh, and that would be an XX component. Since it is a slightly different chromosome, the 23rd pair, then we know that we are dealing with a male. And this is what we see in terms of our genetics. Of course, uh, within our genes, we also carry genetic information, and that is to say that within our DNA, the double helix, which is shown here to the right of the chromosomes, we carry a 3 billion base pair code that dictates what our noses look like, what our eyes are, what color they are, whether we have curly hair or straight hair, and also um, our personality type. A lot of different things in here are dictated by our genetic predisposition. So you could see in here, through this particular foundation, that we come to understand who you and I are through the basics of genetics. The majority of the time, women give birth to one child at a time. In some cases, however, they have multiple births, and the most common of the multiple births would be twins. Um, now, there are two types of twins. You have dizygotic, also known as fraternal twins, and monozygotic, also known as identical twins. With a dizygotic twin, you basically talk about di as in two, and then zygote, meaning there are two zygotes that resulted from the release and fertilization of two eggs. Ova is plural for ovum, which is the woman's eggs. And what we find with these uh, type of twins is that although they uh, were born almost at the same time, they are not more genetically alike than ordinary siblings, meaning someone who may be two years older than you. Um, this is the most common type of birth uh, control, multiple birth type, and uh, it is um, a lot more common in, in uh, industrialized nations because of fertility treatments, uh, art reproductive treatments, which is known as ART, art reproductive, assisted reproductive techniques or treatments uh, for women who have delayed um, pregnancies and then because of their careers and then maybe in their 30s they want to become mothers however their fertility years um, may not be uh, ahead of them in fact they may be behind them and as a result of that then they have to implant different types of uh, fertilized eggs and this could give way to multiple births we also have monozygotic twins which basically means mono coming from one 
uh, and that is that uh, there is a zygote that was fertilized by a sperm, but this separates into two clusters of cells and given birth there to, thereby to a uh, twin that would be identical. Uh, this is one uh, in every 330 births worldwide, and this basically means that the individuals have a, a very similar uh, or identical uh, genetic makeup. As a result of that, there have been a lot of studies that have focused on whether uh, these individuals uh, are byproduct uh, of their genes in terms of their personality, or if it's a byproduct of nurture. You will hear a lot of twin studies throughout the course. It's been noted that the best age for parenthood is typically in the early 20s or in the late teens. That is physically. However, we know that cognitively and maybe even financially, that may not be the best age as we may not be able to afford raising children nor have the maturity to do so. However, uh, as we step away and we start uh, getting older, uh, then the risk of chromosomal disorders, which would be uh, rather than getting 46 chromosomes, we may end up with more than that or fewer than that, uh, they start increasing. Down syndrome, which is uh, uh, a chromosomal disorder and what, that occurs in the 21st pair of chromosomes, would result if instead of having 46, this child now received 47 uh, chromosomes. And specifically, we're looking at the 21st pair. This increases significantly when women are past the age of 35. Now, it's not to say that a woman older than 35 will give birth to a child with Down syndrome, but the chances of that uh, do um, increase the older we get. As far as the male reproductive capacity, we find that the amount of sperm in concentration will also decline after the age of 35. However, it is not as uh, noticeable in men it is, as it is in women. Uh, on average, maybe men who are older would take a little longer to conceive a child, but again, we see uh, individuals who even into their 70s can still impregnate women, whereas women who may have already gone past menopause would not be able to conceive children despite still being sexually active. Uh, we also find that uh, when uh, children are born to teens, they may experience different health problems and problems in general, but it's not linked to the age of the mother. It's typically linked to the uh, emotional immaturity that may exist, uh, economic factors in which the mother may not have any stable job or income, and also the social uh, environment in which the child is born to. As mentioned earlier, uh, conception, which takes place when the sperm meets the egg, is uh, the moment at which we begin to study an individual's development. And we will look at the uh, development prenatally and then see how we move ahead once we are born. Now, the very first stage that we'll look at prenatally is called the germinal period. And this occurs during the first two weeks of pregnancy. Please note that at this point, many women, the majority of them in fact, are not aware that they are pregnant. This is basically at the time where we call a zygote, um, that is a new cell that is formed by the union of an egg and a sperm. And once conceived, uh, after 30 hours, uh, the cells divide very, very rapidly. In fact, we know that typically by the fourth day, um, the uh, organism is composed of 60 to 70 cells. And just like that, they will begin to multiply and multiply to begin to take form of the organism that eventually will become uh, a uh, embryo and eventually a fetus and, and then a, a newborn. Uh, please also note that this is a delicate period as 30% of the zygotes do not survive. And this is important for you to know. Uh, oftentimes when uh, a woman may have conceived a child, uh, she may not know that she's pregnant and uh, maybe there's a delay in her period, but she would still have a period thereafter, leading her to believe that she was never pregnant. But it is possible that she may have conceived, but due to multiple factors, the uh, pregnancy may have been terminated, and that again would become part of the 30% we speak of here. We also find that upon completion of the first two weeks, the germinal period, 
the organism is considered to be a complex organism. The cells are beginning to take shape into, again, what will become a human. In the embryonic period, which is composed or lasts between weeks two and eight, um, the embryo continues to develop in a form that would uh, eventually um, make up what we call a human. You start seeing that toward the end of it, uh, of the embryonic period, um, this embryo now has a heart, brain, and other organs, and even discernible arms, legs, and face by week eight. Well, something that's very impressive is that uh, our brain development is uh, begins at the uh, third week. And when we talk about the development of it, we're talking about the proliferation or the expansion of cells, the multiplication of cells. And the cells that make up a part of our brain and our nervous system are called neurons. Um, these neurons here are developing at 250,000 neurons per minute at week three. Now, when you consider whether women are aware of their state, meaning pregnant or not, we find that still the majority of women may not realize this because this is still within the second month of pregnancy. The fetal period is the last prenatal development stage. Uh, and this is basically what we are known as until we are born. A fetus begins to develop from week eight until birth. And one of the things we know about the fetus is that um, it is by week 12 that we are able to tell through an ultrasound what uh, the um, external genitalia is, meaning the sex of the individual, whether it's a male or a female. Now, it's important to go back to the first slide and remember that the sex is determined upon conception. However, we cannot see it uh, from the outside until week 12 through an ultrasound. Now, what's important about the fetus is that some people believe that the fetus is capable of thinking. And this idea uh, has grown from the fetus response and reaction to when exposed to light and sound. Uh, and by week 20 of pregnancy, we often find that if um, there were to be a spectroscopy, which is a device that is inserted through the vaginal canal, um, and that actually sheds some light into uh, the womb. And what we've seen through an ultrasound is that a child often, uh, when uh, struck by light in the face, they would either cover their face with their arms or turn away. And this leads us to believe that they are uncomfortable by it and that they may actually be reacting cognitively. However, we don't know if it's a, a voluntary reaction to turn away or a reflex because light could be bothering them. Uh, in any case, we find that uh, the majority of the brain's billions of neurons are in place by the fetal period. And that's what, again, leads to the, uh, the big question as to whether fetuses are capable of thinking or not. Another important aspect that you need to be familiar with is the age of viability. The age of viability is basically the point at which the organism can survive if they were to be born prematurely. And what we find is that this typically occurs between the 22nd and 26th week. Anybody born before that is uh, not known to have survived. Uh, anybody born within this period thereafter, the chances of survival start increasing the closer we get to the full term. During pregnancy, there are also sensitive periods. And these are uh, critical periods at which the organism is very vulnerable to different kinds of stimuli. Um, they are individuals who were uh, impacted by the presence of alcohol or nicotine or various other environmental agents. And maybe if they were not in the critical period or sensitive period, their bodies do not seem to have been affected by it. However, there are some who... Uh, may have been exposed to the same agent, the you know, same environmental component, uh, but if impacted during the sensitive period, we could possibly see that in their thought process, or maybe even physically, as we see with fetal alcohol syndrome kids, who are those who are exposed to uh, alcohol while they're, uh, they were developing as an embryo and as a fetus. Also, you need to be familiar with preterm infants. Those are basically uh, individuals who are born before week uh, 38. Please note that premature and preterm are not the same. 
there could have been a preterm infant that would not have been premature. Premature would basically mean that they did not come to full maturation. Um, when someone is preterm, they could have been fully mature, but they were just born before week 38. Here are some common uh, genetic and chromosomal difficulties that uh, are seen. These are just a few of them, and I will just only focus on some of them. As mentioned earlier, uh, Down syndrome is uh, one of the causes of mental retardation, and it is a chromosomal difficulty. Once again, this occurs when there's an extra chromosome at conception. So rather than 46, they end up with 47, and specifically at the 21st pair of chromosomes. Now, we also have PKU at the very top, which is uh, basically uh, a condition that uh, leads and can lead to profound mental retardation if their diet is not controlled. Uh, PKU uh, actually makes uh, the foods that are normally digested properly by those who do not have it, um, it makes them become poisonous and this can affect uh, the cognitive capacity as well as other aspects of our lives if not treated earlier. Uh, a few years ago, Cedar sinai a hospital here in Beverly Hills area, uh, was conducting research to figure out what foods would be best for individuals who suffer from BKU. You have Tay-Sachs disease, which you can see uh, uh, on your own, and sickle cell anemia. Uh, and I'll just briefly tell you about Tay-Sachs disease, which has been a head-scratcher for many individuals. And in the case of um, these individuals, it seems to be more common among uh, Jews of Eastern European ancestry. And the way this is characterized is that there's an earlier death, uh, typically by the age of three or four, because of the body's inability to break down fat. Sometimes uh, these individuals actually gain weight, sometimes they don't, but the fat inside the body um, makes um, the heart uh, function inadequately and bring about this premature death. And with sickle cell anemia, is uh, one that affects 10% of the African American population, uh, and it, while it does not bring about death at the age of three or four, it can also bring about premature death at middle age. Um, this is sometimes seen, again, in different uh, symptoms, which are seen right here in this slide. There are over 70 chromosomal um, abnormalities and disorders that we know of. Uh, we're going to be focusing on three of the most common ones, Klein filters, Turner's, and XYY or triple X syndrome. Klein filter syndrome is basically composed of 47 chromosomes, as you can see. When we look at these chromosomes, we're talking about the 23rd pair that determines our genitalia. Now, keep in mind that there is one extra X that shouldn't be there. Uh, in order for this to be a male, it should have been just XY. That extra X chromosome basically inhibits the uh, presence of the male genitalia. And so what you end up with is a tall, feminized body that has small testes uh, and that has perhaps something that's called gynecomastia, which is uh, breast growth, as if it were to be a female, but we know that it is a male. Because the Y chromosome is there, you are going to have testosterone, but it's going to be in low levels. Uh, the presence of the extra X will, again, bring about breast development, uh, and oftentimes this will also result in infertility uh, because testosterone levels are essential for uh, spermatogenesis or the uh, development of, of sperm. Uh, one of the ways we could treat this is through therapy, hormonal therapy, uh, which would basically enhance the second, secondary sexual characteristics, that is facial hair, uh, voice depth, muscle mass. Uh, this often goes undiagnosed uh, or as two uh, out of three men are never diagnosed with uh, XXY uh, or Klinefelter's syndrome. Turner syndrome is the opposite of uh, Klinefelter in some way, uh, because while Klinefelter had 47 chromosomes, this one actually only has 45. Um, you can see that, again, the 23rd pair in this case uh, is characterized by the presence of one X and then the absence of the other. This basically gives way to a female birth, um, but because of the absence of the other X, the ovaries and various other uh, secondary sexual characteristics are not fully developed. Uh, 
um, with the ovaries underdeveloped, you end up with a condition called amenorrhea, which is basically the absence of menstruation. This is sometimes uh, the way that individuals find out they have Turner syndrome when they get to the age of 17, 18, and they have not yet started uh, their period. Um, because of the ovaries under development, we also have infertility. And, and one of the um, body types that we see uh, among individuals who have Turner syndrome is uh, short individuals with um, uh, breast development that is widely spaced uh, out more so than average. Um, these individuals are also likely to suffer from mental retardation and um, so, so far the therapeutic approaches we've had are hormonal again by administering higher levels of estrogen and progesterone which are not secreted by them because of the absence of the ovaries and the other X we can uh, try to alleviate some of these different characteristics um, some of the health problems that these individuals experience in adulthood are hypertension, bone thinning, and thyroid problems. Here's a picture of someone who has Turner syndrome, and you can see that this person is uh, a little uh, shorter than four feet tall by uh, what we see in there. And once again, the anatomy of an individual is impacted by the absence of the X chromosome. Now, to the naked eye, an untrained eye, it may just be an ordinary body, but you would see that, again, inside the genitalia of the reproductive system would not necessarily uh, be there to reproduce and to bring about the monthly uh, sexual differentiation. We also have hormonal disorders, and we are going to look at two. Now, keep in mind that chromosomal disorders are things that just we couldn't have prevented upon conception. It just uh, so happened that uh, an individual, rather than getting 46 chromosomes, may have ended up with more or fewer than that. Hormonal disorders uh, does not mean that uh, the chromosomes are not in place. It just means that the hormones that are required for adequate functioning are not necessarily there. So we'll be looking at congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH, and androgen insensitivity syndrome, AIS. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is basically made up, as you can see, of a female, uh, two uh, X chromosomes in there, uh, but this female is exposed to an excess amount of androgen, which is a uh, hormone typically found in higher levels among men. Um, this exposure prenatally gives way to uh, the development of internal organs in a female, but sometimes it could bring about uh, a masculinized external genitalia. Uh, and what you end up with is having an individual who may uh, not be able to necessarily express their sexuality as someone who has uh, defined uh, genitalia of a female or male. Uh, however, because they do have internal uh, reproductive system that is functional, pregnancy is often possible among many individuals who have this. Not surprisingly, this also uh, gives way to higher rates of occurrence of bisexuality and homosexuality. And this has given way to a lot of interesting research as to whether individuals who may uh, have uh, a non-heterosexual orientation would uh, have perhaps a hormonal uh, imbalance that could bring about these changes. Here you can see uh, the genitalia of an individual with uh, CAH, and this is basically uh, a, the uh, vaginal uh, canal uh, with a very enlarged clitoris that would have been a little bit more similar to the penile glands, which would be the equivalent of the head of the penis. Now, the introitus, which is again the entry to the uh, vaginal canal, is there, and internally in these individuals, because they do have both uh, sex chromosomes, which are XX, they would have and could have functional ovaries. Therefore, uh, if there were to be sperm that is uh, deposited in there and there is ovulation, a pregnancy is possible. AIS is the other uh, hormonal difficulty we'll be discussing. And again, you can see that this is not a chromosomal difficulty, as in this case we're dealing with a male. Uh, however, 
although there are 46 chromosomes and it seems as the XY makeup is uh, adequate, the body of the individual doesn't seem to respond to the testosterone that's being produced by the testicles. Um, as a result of that, you would have no internal reproductive structure except for the two undescended testes. And oftentimes because uh, there is no um, absorption and functionality in the testosterone that's being produced, rather than having external genitalia, they may end up with what is known as a shallow vagina. Uh, and sometimes they have gynecomastia, which is, again, um, the development of breast. And since sometimes they may be perceived as females, the expectation is that they would menstruate, but because they do not have an internal reproductive system, they do not have a menstrual cycle uh, and are infertile. Uh, oftentimes the way this has been treated with individuals grow older is that they may perform a surgery to lengthen the vagina if the individual were to choose to live as a female. However, it is important to know that genetically a person with an XY would be a male uh, but would have some feminized characteristics. Here's a picture of someone with AIS genitalia and once again this is uh, an XY it's a male but it is uh, basically uh, unresponsive to the testosterone that would come from the uh, Y um, chromosome and as a result of the uh, irresponsive uh, functionality of the uh, body they end up with uh, a feminized body on the outside because of conditions like the ones discussed there's been a lot of interest in understanding more uh, how come individuals are born sometimes with uh, more or fewer chromosomes than the majority of us. Uh, genetic counseling is a relatively new um, field that seeks to uh, communicate and predict uh, whether uh, a couple is likely to have a healthy child or not. They often perform these type of assessments through blood tests and they try to understand whether the couple would bring about a child who is likely to have difficulties. Um, the common candidates for these uh, are typically those who have had multiple miscarriages and those who are older than the age of 35. And the reason why is because of the chances of uh, having a child with a chromosomal uh, difficulty uh, are increasing as we get older. Gene therapy is another relatively new way of also correcting some genetic abnormalities and what they do is they try to modify uh, our genetic makeup or our genome. Uh, that is to say that for example if I uh, am born with uh, a genetic makeup that makes me suffer from asthma and they recognize that it is the asthma is brought about because of the absence of uh, a particular gene then what they can do is that they can actually uh, deliver that specific gene to my DNA so that I can um, have a life without asthma. Uh, additionally, maybe there's another condition of depression of some sort and that may be because of a gene that's there and they find out that if they were to remove that gene from my DNA then I would not suffer from depression. As a result of that, gene therapy could come in to correct genetic abnormalities and allow us to have hopefully a better life. We just went over a significant amount of information. Let's review some of this stuff. Try not to look at your notes and try to answer these questions. Which of the chromosome pairs dictates our sex? If you answered the 23rd pair, you are correct. It is the 23rd pair that allows us to determine whether someone is going to have XX, XY, or possibly another variation, such as the ones that are there. Question 2. Which is the least common type of multiple birth? As you remember from one of the slides earlier, we talked about how dizygotic births, fraternal twins, are the most common. And they're more common because in industrialized nations, as women delay uh, motherhood, 
they find themselves needing assistive reproductive therapy or techniques to help them get pregnant. However, the answer to this one here would be least common type of multiple birth would be monozygotic. And monozygotic would mean that it comes from one uh, egg that was fertilized and then separated into two. Question three was answered in question two by stating again that the delay of motherhood is considered to be responsible for the multiple births in industrialized nations as women are in need of assisted reproductive therapy and they often have uh, in vitro fertilization which requires that there may be uh, the insertion of fertilized eggs simultaneously uh, rather than just one. This gives way to an increase in multiple births.